Hello, history buffs, and welcome to this installment of Quick and Dirty Art on the Romantic Movement and the revolutionary period that spawned it. So first, before we take a look at the, revo re the revolutionary aspects of Romanticism in art and culture, so who were the Romantics? They were revolutionaries. They were hippies of their time period. They were people that believed in the human potential to achieve incredible things. And so they, the time period that brought about the revolutionary aspects of the Romantic movement uh, began first with the Neoclassical movement. So for a little review, we covered Neoclassicism in a previous uh, video or previous uh, presentation that you might have seen, where we talked about the uh, Neoclassical love of classical learning, like Homer here being apotheosized, or Jupiter and Thetis's story, uh, which was kind of romantic and a little pornographic for the time period. And then we have Jacques-Louis David getting into the more propagandistic aspect of the neoclassical movement, where he gives us the death of Marat, or the oath of the Heratai, also the death of Socrates, the man that's willing to die for his country, even if uh, they don't believe he's actually dying for his country, he's dying for his cause. A cause that he believes is noble and virtuous. All right, and then we have him giving us the Sabine women, all about civil war and discord, and the idea that we need reconciliation, uh, especially during a time of the reign of terror in French history. And then, of course, Jacques-Louis David giving us Napoleon crossing the Alps, doing what Hannibal could not, Napoleon can do. So, the Romantic movement, though, is going to give us something a little bit different. It's going to take some of the ideas of the neoclassical period, and you could say expand upon, upon them, and in other ways also completely kibosh them. So, first of all, the R Romantic movement, what was it? Well, it was an art artistic and cultural period that lasted from the 1780s to the 1840s, which was characterized by art that sought emotional impact through spontaneity, revolutionary enthusiasm, a return to nature, and the human potential for tremendous accomplishment. So uh, that's my working definition here. The 1780s, meaning it kind of got started during the French Revolution, and then really we can see the end of the Romantic period with the failures of the revolutions of 1848. And that gets us into a time period known as realism, which is not nearly as much fun. So the Romantic movement is really based upon the philosophy of Rousseau, who is seen as the intellectual father of uh, the French Revolution uh, in a way, but also certainly of the uh, Romantic movement as well. Now, the Romantic movement in art and culture certainly borrowed his ideas of individualism and this idea of the social contract, noble savage, a return to nature, the need for experiential learning, all of those things wrapped up into the art and culture of the time period. Now certainly the French Revolution had a huge impact as well as um, the uh, Enlightenment philosophy from Rousseau. Um, and then the Industrial Revolution, we see a, a, um, a rebellion against many of the things happening happening in the Industrial Revolution, the clouds of smoke and uh, the, the terrible working conditions and the change of nature, certainly, as many uh, poets and writers of the time period felt that the Industrial Revolution was giving us satanic mills. And speaking of some of these poets and t writers of the time period, they were what we call bohemians and living a bohemian lifestyle. Well, not that one. Uh, a bohemian lifestyle. There we go. All right, and so the bohemian lifestyle is this idea of these romantic people who, who uh, are seeking truth, freedom, beauty, and love through things like writing their hearts and their souls into, into ideas and books and poems and uh, seeking to free themselves of the confines of society, even if that means taking some drugs such as uh, the wormwood that was put into absinthe. And so they'll be tripping on absinthe uh, in order to achieve the, the uh, emotional high that they were going for. So while the 1960s culture was certainly fueled by marijuana and LSD, the Romantic period will be fueled by absinthe. So now we'll take a look at some of the Romantic achievements in art and now architecture as well. So first we'll start with the Arc de Triomphe. So the Arc de Triomphe is one of the most famous monuments of Paris, and as you can see from the boulevards and uh, that are surrounding the Arc de Triomphe, all 
roads seemed to lead, in Paris anyway, to this Arc de Triomphe. And that was Napoleon's intention. In 1806, when Napoleon ordered the construction of the Arc de Triomphe, he wanted Paris to be the center of the map of Europe and the world. And so we have things like the Champs-Élysées that you can see there, a massive street leading to a ginormous roundabout uh, that surrounds the Arc de Triomphe. Now, work of the Arc de Triomphe was stopped in 1814 when Napoleon was defeated and um, was started up again in 1826 thanks to King Louis Philippe, who wanted to borrow the cult of Napoleon to help aggrandize his own power. And so the Arc de Triomphe honors those who fought and died for France in the Rev French Revolution uh, and Napoleonic Wars all the way up through World Wars One and Two. It has the names of vict victories and various generals inscribed on the inner and outer surfaces. Beneath its vault lies the tomb of the unknown soldier from World War One, and the tomb is meant to represent the over 1.5 million French soldiers who died during World War I alone. Beneath it is what's called the Eternal Flame of Remembrance, and it was first lit on November the 11th, 1923, by a guy named André Maginot, the guy that's going to build the, or construct and design the Maginot Line for World War II, which will not work very well. Uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, every evening at 6.30 p.m. it is rekindled and veterans lay wreaths and, and various uh, things at the uh, at the flickering flame. Now it's the second largest triumphal arc standing today in the world. The first largest was built in 1982 by North Korea, deliberately built to be larger because, you know, overcompensating? Anyway, so the four main uh, pillars that we have dating to the French Revolution begin with Le Pen. Depot de 1792, or Les Marseilles. I'm sorry, I butchered that. But <clears throat> this this uh, group celebrates the cause of the French First Republic, and um, beginning with the August Uprising, which overthrew the monarchy officially and then established the Republic. And so we see here the uh, volunteers that are surrounding the personification of liberty. And you notice that liberty looks a little bit, um, you could say, androgynous or, or, or ambiguous with their, her sexuality because it's obviously a female because um, she's got some some breasts underneath her, her uh, armor, but she has a very, uh, very masculine-looking face. And so that's a call to both males and females to participate in this revolution. The next arc is Le Triomphe de 18... 10, um, which was celebrating the Treaty of Schönbrunn, um, and it features Napoleon crowned by the goddess of victory. Next we have Le Resistance de 1814, which is the French resistance to the Allied armies during the War of the Sixth Coalition, still during the French Revolution. And then finally, Le Pas de 1815, which commemorates the Treaty of Paris, which concluded the French Revolutionary Wars and Napoleonic conflicts. So, beautiful, romantic, romantic rippling abs and muscles everywhere. I mean, it's just glorious with wings of victories and laurel wreaths. Oh, it's perfect romantic architecture. Next, we'll see some romantic art by a famous and by far one of my favorite French painters, Eugene Delacroix. So Eugene Delacroix gives us the death of Sardanopolis here. The story goes that Sardanopolis knew that an army was coming to take over his palace, and he knew that resistance would be futile. And so what you see here is basically a snapshot of the moment when Sardanopolis looked among his court and said that the entire building was to be burned with everything and everyone inside. And so if you just take a look at some of the faces of the people here, like the guys that are carrying things around uh, on trays, you see the guards who are taking knives about to plunge them into the prostitutes of his harem. You see the various prostitutes who are pleading and begging and, and guards that are even murdering the horses because those can't be given up to the enemy. You see some of the prostitutes who have just given up all hope. You see people who are just grasping at the king, trying to get him to change his mind. And there he sits, saying, what? It's my stuff. I'm going to burn it. What? What now? All right, so the death of Sardanopolis, beautiful and romantic. Next, we get Eugene Delacroix with Liberty Leading the People. And in this 
portrayal, we have him participating in and painting the July Revolution of 1830. You might recall from our discussions earlier that the July Revolution did not go quite according to plan for the working class. Uh, they did get a new king out of the deal, got rid of the Bourbons and Charles X, and brought in instead King Louis-Philippe, who turned out to not be such a bro to the working class. But here you can see that liberty charging forward with the, with the tricolour, or tricolour, is uh, um, holding nothing back. And I mean, she is exposed uh, in at her chest level, which in art means that she is vulnerable, as she charges forward with a flag in one hand and a musket and bayonet in the other, calling to the crowds behind her. If you look over her, her uh, left shoulder, you can see the smoldering smoke of Paris. Uh, you can see things like the Notre Dame Cathedral in the background, and then standing next to her, to her is the youthful enthusiasm of a kid that looks like Gavron. Roche from Les Miserables. All right, so this kid is running forward, double fisting. I mean, he's ready to just shoot dudes left and right. He's holding nothing back. But then if you look over uh, right beneath the flag, you can see some of the other men who are older and more resistant. If you take a look at Eugene Delacroix himself, he is somewhat withdrawn. He's ready to charge forward, but at the same time, he is resistant because he knows that you know, bullets hurt, and you could die. And then there's another man next to him who also is withdrawn. The body language says everything there. Below, you can see the bodies of men who have fallen before them. And then one man, dressed in red, white, and blue, is looking up for hope at liberty as she leads the people. Oh! Beautiful. It's glorious art. All right, the next one that we have is Eugene Delacroix giving us the massacre at Chios. So at Chios, this was during the time of the Greek rebellion against the uh, the Ottoman Turk Empire, and it didn't go so well for the Greeks for a long time because the uh, the powers of Europe did not want to help them because it went against their conservative ideals. And so here you can see the fate of the Greeks at the town of Chios, where they were butchered by the Ottoman overlords. You can see dark, shady characters in the background. You can see another one who is riding atop a, a war horse and has people uh, who are exposed, again showing their vulnerability, and they are wrapped in chains and being brought with him into slavery. And then down below you can see a woman who is maybe hopeless, uh, maybe has given up at this point. You can see others with just absolute hopelessness and dejection on their face. Perhaps they are about on the brink of death, if not dead already. And then you see a baby trying to suckle from his now dead mother. I mean, if this doesn't call you to action, Europeans, I don't know what does. All right, now we're going to take a look at another revolutionary painting. This one from Francisco Goya, who is a Spaniard, who was around during the time of the uh, French Revolution and French occupation um, of Spain. And so you might recall that Napoleon put his brosif Joseph on the throne of Spain. That didn't go so well, um, because the Spanish felt that, that the Bonapartes and the French who were occupying them in general were the enemy. Antichrist. And so, therefore, Napoleon had to be overthrown through a massive rebellion. Well, here you can see one of these Spaniards leading the rest. And you can see all of Spanish, the different Spanish classes combined here. You can see a monk there with his funny little haircut. You can see a peasant who has been shot. You see other peasants and working class members crowding around this one man dressed in white with his arms spread out in a sign of supplication and, in a way, uh, self-sacrifice. I mean, he's very, very much a Christ-like looking figure about to be martyred for the cause. And then you've got the faceless, nameless enemies of Napoleon's elite guard, which would have been very recognizable to the Spaniards of the time because of their tall hats. Next, you see from Francisco Goya the untamable nature of fire. The untamable nature of, really, nature itself. You can see the fire in the background in the upper left, and then down in the foreground, you can see this swooning mass of people who are trying desperately to escape and, and not only crowding each other, but trampling one another to escape the fire and the flames and the smoke. 
Frankly, Goya is trying to tell us here, I think, that uh, nature cannot be tamed, and humans themselves need to recognize the power and awesomeness of nature. All right, and so speaking of nature, we see in previous times in European history where they wanted to harness nature in a way that was tameable and presentable, like these Baroque gardens. All right, so these Baroque gardens uh, were meant to be uh, meant to be tamed, but now in the Romantic period, gardens are going to become a thing where you want them to be untamable. You want them to look magnificent, majestic, and overgrown, where you're not snipping anything because that goes against its nature. And so these kinds of little gardens will be popping up all over England especially, uh, even in between little houses and middle class districts because they want to uh, have that romantic appeal of a return to nature. Now we're going to see one from Goya who's giving us not so much uh, nature but human nature and the scariness of it all. This one is Saturn devouring his son. So you might recall the legend of Saturn, where it was prophesied that one of Saturn's sons would de dethrone him. So he devoured all of his children right as they were born. But one of them escaped, and that one was Jupiter. Jupiter now will eventually dethrone him, and in this allegory for power, what it shows us is the way in which power treats its children in order to stay in power. So Goya had first-hand experience with this as he watched the Spanish monarchy destroy his country and then weaken itself right as Napoleon was coming to power. And then Napoleon especially is going to destroy and uh, his country as his forces occupy the nation. Now we'll take a look at Theodore Geracult giving us the Raft of Medusa. In the Raft of Medusa, what Theodore Geracult did was he definitely left the studio to figure out how to paint this one. All right, many artists during the Renaissance and Baroque period stayed in the studio. They did not leave the studio. Even in the neoclassical era, this didn't happen as frequently. But Theodore Geracult's going to break tradition here by uh, studying in an insane asylum in order to study how humans react to pain and terror and fear. And while he was there, he learned a lot, as you can see from this painting, where we've got a raft of survivors whose ship has crashed, and way, way off in the distance in the right, you can see on the horizon a tiny little ship. As waves are crashing up and around this raft, these men at the top are, are seeing the ship and trying to signal it, but as you move backward down to the left and then down toward the water in the foreground, you can see hopelessness, despair, you can see fear and terror and death. But as you move up, there's this romantic ideal of maybe, just maybe, we'll signal that ship. What a cool way to do it. And then here we have Caspar David Friedrich. So Caspar David Friedrich um, was, fought in the Napoleonic Wars. He uh, gives us this painting as an allegory for some of the things, or a representation for some of the things that was going that were going on in Europe during the age of the Napoleonic era. Some believe that this is a self-portrait of Caspar David Friedrich, um, but he calls this thing the Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, and what it really probably represents instead is a guy by the name of Colonel. Friedrich Godhard von Brinken, um, who was in the Saxon infantry, wears the green uniform of a volunteer ranger, who were, these are the guys that were called into service against Napoleon um, for the Prussian ranks uh, in 1813 and 1814, in order to, uh, in order to fight the a war of liberation, as they called it, against Napoleonic uh, hegemony. And so this painting is serving as a patriotic tribute, probably, to that group of men. And so the fog that you see there is representative of the Napoleonic era of domination over European states. You can see these tiny little rocks jutting up and these hillsides and mountains just kind of peeking through the clouds but everything else is under this fog. And so what, what may be being said here is that there's a call for more action to, to pop up out of this fog and to take back what was ours. Here in this one, we get another of the anti-Napoleon takes, this time from a British poet and painter by the name of William Blake. This is Nelson guiding Leviathan. Now, instead of a lifelike portrait, Blake decides to, decided to paint Nelson's spiritual likeness. He stands on top of the biblical sea creature, the Leviathan, whose body encircles him. But Nelson controls the beast with a bridle, if you take a look at his hand there, um, and attached to its neck, uh, which he holds loosely in his left hand. Now, trapped in and crushed under, or in one case, half-consumed within the Leviathan's coiled body, are ten figures, 
And these ten figures that are held within the grips of the Leviathan are representative of the ten nations that were, were defeated within continental Europe, which were uh, dominated by the French during the Napoleonic Wars. And so Admiral Nelson not only standing atop the Leviathan, but also trying to free all of these uh, different figures is representative of all the work that he did at Trafalgar, his sacrifice at Trafalgar, and therefore the victory for all of Europe that he will be able to have by slowly but surely destroying Napoleon's ambitions for Europe. Next we have a very interesting um, uh, painting by William Blake. William Blake gives us the Ancient of Days. So in this image we see William Blake um, is giving us a little portrayal, a visual representation of his differing type of religion or mythology. All right, so uh, William Blake didn't believe in standard religions, didn't believe in like Christianity and that kind of thing, and so he made his own mythology uh, in which he believed that there was this this god called Urizen, and Urizen in his re religion represented reason, laws, traditions, and he was a very cruel god, but uh, he, you know, felt that that was the god that created the world and the universe, and so he even wrote a little book that was very similar to the book of uh, Genesis called the book of Urizen. I don't know if there's any Kanye West fans out there, but this is very similar to the book of Jesus, written by Jesus himself, Kanye West. And speaking of musicians, let's talk about the ultimate musician of the Romantic period, Mr. Ludwig von Beethoven. So Beethoven uh, ha uh, gives us some beautiful uh, work for the time period, of course, and a lot of it was actually based upon the career of Napoleon Bonaparte. So Beethoven had originally conceived of dedicating a symphony to Napoleon Bonaparte, and according to uh, his biography, or excuse me, uh, Beethoven's biographer, he admired the ideals of the French Revolution, he saw Napoleon as the embodiment of the French Revolution, and what he wanted to do with his Eroica symphony was to give the the uh, title of the work and, and call it Bonaparte. His original intention for Eroica Symphony was to call it Bonaparte. So according to Beethoven's pupil and assistant Ferdinand Reis, when Napoleon proclaimed himself Emperor of the French in May of 1804, Beethoven became disgusted and went to the table where the completed score lay. He took hold of the title page and tore it up in a rage. And this is uh, the account that was told by Reese after watching this. He said, In writing this symphony, Beethoven had been thinking of Bonaparte, but Bonaparte while he was first consul. At that time, Beethoven had the highest esteem for him and compared him to the greatest consuls of ancient Rome. Not only I, but many of Beethoven's closer friends saw this symphony on his table, beautifully copied in manuscript, with the word Bonaparte inscribed at the very top of the title page, and Ludwig von Beethoven at the very bottom. I was the first to tell him the news that Bonaparte had declared himself emperor, whereupon he broke into a rage and exclaimed, so he is no more than a common mortal? Now, too, he will tread underfoot all the rights of man indulge only his ambition. Now he will think himself superior to all men and become a tyrant. Beethoven went to the table, seized the top of the title page, tore it in half and threw it on the floor. The page had to be recopied and it was only now that the symphony received the title Symphonia Eroica. Oh! Now that's a story. All right, now if we take a look at Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, uh, we can see in visual form the, the method of his trying to create ecstasy and hysteria. Historian John McKay says, Beethoven's music sets in motion the lever of fear, of awe, of horror, of suffering, and awakens just that infinite longing, which is the essence of romanticism.